if you're familiar with Korean Buddhism or the sudden and gradual debate, then no doubt you're familiar with Venerable Sung Char and his controversial book, Orthodox Path of the Sun School, published in 1981. I do not promise to offer any shocking new discoveries or even new interpretations of Sung Char's work. Instead, I'd like to spend the next 15 or so uh, minutes talking about the historical context in which this work was written. I want to do this because it's so easy to simply reach the conclusion that Sung Char's book is just a product of sectarian polemics or a continuation of a debate almost as old as Chan and Sun Buddhism itself. Sung Char wasn't interested in polemics. In fact, he wasn't particularly interested in the sudden and gradual debate either. He wanted to be able to tell people who started to lose faith in Buddhism and Sun Buddhism in particular, that it was worth saving, practicing, and learning. So why did Sun Buddhism need to be saved and more precisely saved from itself? Not long after liberation, a national conference for Buddhist clergy was convened in September of 1945 at the monastery Tegosa, today's Chogesa. And there the decision to abolish the colonial period temple law was made. A new charter for Joseon Buddhism was promulgated to replace it. To effectively uphold and observe the laws laid out in the new charter, a central administration for Joseon Buddhism was established. But the process of building a new identity after liberation was far from over. Those who participated in the national conference were also in agreement that new major centers of sun learning or chongming were necessary. In 1946, in fulfillment of the vow to establish a major center of sun learning, leaders of Korea's post-liberation Joseon Buddhist order decided to establish the Kaya Chongnim at the monastery Heinsa. Chongdam and Songchar, young reform-minded monks at the time, went to Heinsa to join the cause. When Kaya Chongnim was launched, the intent of its establishment was made clear. The Chongnim was meant to serve as a firm reminder that celibate sun bhikshus not administrator monks or sapansung who were in charge of the Korean Sangha. What a chongnim provided was training for bhikshus, not administrators, popular prayer specialists, or proselytizers. Disagreements about monastic rules and fundraising, however, forced some, like Songchar, to leave the chongnim. Songchar chose to continue his self cultivation at Neonam near Tongdosa instead. It was under these circumstances that Songchar found himself establishing a retreat society or kyrsa at the monastery Bongamsa in 1947. The retreat society gave Sangchar the opportunity to realize his vision of governing a monastic community with what he considered to be monastic rules of the highest standard. It also freed him from the burden of fundraising, which continued to bear the stigma of being uh, the primary concern of non-celibate abbots and administrative monks. Sangchar's retreat society quickly acquired a reputation for its strict observance of monastic rules and its dedication to sun learning. Rather than follow existing pure rules for Chan or Sun monasteries, Songchor deemed it necessary to write his own for Bongamsa. These strict rules were meant to show the world the participants' desire to return to the old ways to a time before Korean Buddhism became corrupted, especially by colonialism. More practically, they were also meant to serve as a deterrent against monks who were still attached to the colonial monastic lifestyle. The lifestyle was generally understood to emphasize proselytization, dependence on popular religion, and frequent and understanding interaction with lay people. It was also understood as the preferred lifestyle of the non-celibate monks who owed and controlled most of the Buddhist property in Korea. In keeping with the spirit of maintaining purity and returning to what they believed to be the old ways, Songchar and others at the retreat are said to have uh, burned the red robes made of silk and smashed their fine wooden begging bowls. They also made the radical decision to remove structures that had little relation to the Buddha uh, from the monastery. This included the hall for worshiping the mountain spirit and also the altar for the seven spirits, uh, seven stars. Images of the mountain spirit, seven stars, and other miscellaneous protector deities were also removed from the monastery. The monastic rules they set for themselves at Bongamsa also forbid, forbid them from performing popular prayers for special donations, which was arguably, with the exception perhaps of rent from tenant farmers, the most common income source for Buddha, Buddhist clergy members, especially non-celibate uh, abbots in Korea at the time. The retreat's emphasis on the strict observance of monastic rules and insistence on religious purity should be understood as a response to three historical developments. First, as mentioned earlier, 
liberation removed uh, um, co colonial period uh, administrator monks from positions of power. This was interpreted by some, like Tsung Chart, as an opportunity to put Sun monks like himself behind the driver's wheel, driving wheel. Second, the Korean Sangha was split between celibate and non-celibate monks. Ownership of monasteries and smaller temples belong name, uh, mainly to the non-celibate majority. The celibate minority was eager to find a way to gain ownership of properties under the control of the non-celibate majority. Third, the liberated country struggled to uh, overcome the systemic poverty that resulted after the withdrawal of Japanese colonial forces, political chaos introduced by division and new occupation by the US and Soviet Union, and also ideological battles rooted in class conflict. The Bongamza retreat also took place at a time when presidential candidates were being assassinated, monks were, being, uh, cl were clashing violently over monastic property, and intellectuals and left-leaning monks were drawn misleadingly to the promise of establishing a socialist anti-colonial utopia in Pyongyang. The retreat's timing was critical for other reasons as well. The volatile uh, political atmosphere of Korea at the time was also due in part to the strong possibility of holding separate elections for the North and South Korea, which did in, in fact happen. But even more impactful than division perhaps was the Farmland Reform Act of 1949. This new law, which came into effect in October of 1950, presented a serious economic threat to Buddhist monasteries, which still derived much of their income from monastic land cultivated by tenant farmers. The law in essence granted the tenant farmers ownership of this land. The Buddhist establishment continued to uh, petition the government to rescind the law. What it got was a compromise in 1952 land adjacent to the monastery under self-cultivation would be returned to the monastery. Songchar's efforts to achieve Baijang style self-sufficiency should be understood in this context. But needless to say, the Bongamsa retreat was more than just a simple response to social and political change. It was also a religious movement that sought to build a new ideological foundation on which to rebuild the Sangha in Korea. And this is exactly what the retreat did. Isolated from the chaos that ensued, the Bongamza retreat was able to stay true to its vow of maintaining unrealistically high standards for a monastic community. Those who were attracted to these high standards eventually went on to form the new leadership of the present Jogi order in Korea. The retreat produced no less than four supreme patriarchs, Cheongdam and Songchar included, and seven chief administrators. The Bongamza retreat, like the Kaya Chongim, was also significant for uh, being attempts at reform launched not in the major cities, Seoul and Pyongyang, but in the countryside. There was no way one could mistake the reclusive ideal espoused in these reform efforts. If Buddhism was going to be reformed, it had to remain aloof from the hustle and bustle and the chaos of everyday life in post-liberation Korea. And there was plenty of chaos in, Korea, in the Korean Peninsula. Songchar was in his late 30s when North Korean forces crossed the border on the 25th of June, 1950. He had also uh, already left Bungamza, which uh, was apparently being harassed by guerrilla forces seeking shelter in the mountains. It was, it was no less chaotic after the war. As the Korean War was coming to a close in 1952, the monk Taehui raised the issue of the impact of the Farmland Reform Act and made a formal request to convert some monast monasteries into the property of celibate abbots. The celibate minority will soon gain wind in their sails from the uh, order issued directly by President Sing Man Ri. In uh, addition to giving Buddhist leaders due recognition for their important contribu contributions to resisting colonialism, Ri, more practically, needed to secure the support of Buddhist voters who formed a formidable conservative vo uh, voting bloc. In 1954, the president in no uncertain terms declared that the Joseon Buddhist order and its monastic properties belonged to celibate monks. He thus ordered married monks to leave their monasteries, that is, their homes. The non-celibate monks who controlled the central administration of the Joseon Buddhist order quickly convened a meeting to revise the charter into, into a constitution and change the name of the order to the Chogyu order of Korean Buddhism. They also proposed to split the Sangha into practitioner monks and proselytizer monks. They also proposed this, uh, um, uh, realizing victory was near, the celibate reformists uh, convened a national conference for Buddhist, Buddhist clergy. There, they similarly abandoned the existing charter and replaced it with their own constitution for the Chogyu order. 
Emboldened in November, they forced their way into Tegosa and renamed it Chogesa. They also abandoned Tego Po and established Pojo Chinul instead as the founding patriarch or Chongjo of the Choge order. With further support from the government, all rights to monastic property ma management and the administration of the Choge order were eventually transferred to celibate monks the following year in 1955. For reasons that remain unclear, Songchar remained, uh, uh, maintained distance from the events that unfolded in Seoul. Rather than engage uh, engaged the so-called purification movement, that is the removal of non-celibate monks from power head on, Songchar continued to devote all of his energy to self-cultivation and son learning. At the invitation of Han Song, the abbot of Pagesa on Mount Palgong, uh, Songchar moved to a nearby hermitage named uh, Songjanam, uh, uh, located deep in south of the mountain in 1955. And thus he began his famous decade long practice of, quote, not leaving the cave, right, unquote. He had a steel fence set up around the perimeter of the hermitage to cut off all contact with the outside world and make firm his resolve to remain at the hermitage. Interaction was limited to family and a few patrons on special occasions. A decade later in 1965, Songchar delivered sermons for a full assembly for the first time since he began the retreat at Songjana. Two years later in 1967, Songchar was installed as the head of the new Hain Chongni. He had declined to serve as the abbot of Hainzai in 1955. After 12 years of devoting himself to his studies, Songchar seems to have felt that it was the right time to finally accept the position. Songchar will continue to serve as abbot of Hainza and reside, reside at the nearby hermitage Pengyonam for the next 27 years. During that time, he served as the seventh and eighth supreme patri patriarch of the Choge order. And it was also during this period that Songchar launched his vehement critique of Pojo Jinnur's supposed sudden and gradual approach. It's difficult to say why Songchar deemed it necessary to focus on his studies for another decade or so before assuming the abbacy of Hainza. At 55, he was still relatively young when he assumed the position. What's clear is that during the, his decade-long retreat at Songjanam, Songchar had his massive library with him, a library that he put to good use. As soon as he assumed the abbacy of Hainza, Songchar delivered a series of sermons known as the 100-day sermons uh, from December of 1967 to February of 1968. The same library will also serve as the backbone of Songchar's doxographic masterpiece, The Orthodox Path of the Sun School, or Sonmun Chongno, is published in 1981. This new work was based on the 100-day sermons. Naturally, it advances the same claims about the importance of seeing one's own nature, or kyonsong. But the Orthodox Path of the Sun School delves uh, a bit deeper into the topic that he raised briefly in the sermons and another earlier publication, uh, from 1976, titled The Dharma Lineage of Korean Buddhism, Hanguk Pulgyoi Pongmek, namely Pojo Chinul and his soteriology. That's what he critiqued. If these publications are uh, examined out of context, though, one could easily reach the conclusion that Songchar was simply obsessed with polemics and identity politics. But Songchar himself clearly did not intend his sermons or publications to be used as crude polemical tools. These publications are extensions of the vision he hoped to realize since the Pongamsa retreat of 1947. What made Songchar's publications seem so polemical uh, was the context in which they were written. The promulgation of the new constitution for the unified Chogi order in 1962 uh, <clears throat> kindled the flames of an ongoing debate. This debate began when Tego Bu was first named founding patriarch in, uh, in the Tegosa law of 1941 under colonial rule. The choice of Tego was far from controversial at the time. Late chosen period Sun genealogies often traced Korean Sun lineages back to Tego and ultimately Linji Ishuan. Lee's lineage claims acquired the veneer of objectivity from colonial period scholarship. A systemic, uh, systematic argument uh, in favor of Tego as founding patriarch of Korean Sun Buddhism was presented by Po Gwang Kim Young Su in a series of early articles published in the 1930s. But Tego, like the colonial Buddhist administrators who acknowledged him as the founding patriarch, had to be put on the chopping block after liberation. Regardless of who Tego actually was and what he taught, Tego had come to be seen as the patron saint of the colonial administrators and non-celibate abbots. The celibate monks therefore needed another uh, candidate for founding patriarch. 
whence the choice to give that honor to Chinur in 1954. For a little less than a decade, uh, Korean Sun monks, as a consequence, honored two founding patriarchs. When the unified Choge order was launched in 1962 under the watchful eyes of the military junta government, a compromise had to be reached. Uh, the compromise, however, was one that pleased neither side. In the preamble to the new constitution, neither Tego nor Chinur was recognized as the founding patriarch. That honor, as uh, mentioned earlier, went to Dui. The preamble does, however, men uh, mention Tego as the reviver patriarch. Jinur's name is nowhere to be found in the preamble. Instead, the first article states that Dui is the founding patriarch, Jinur the revitalizer patriarch, and Tego the reviver patriarch. In response to the glaring absence of Chinur's name in the preamble and the refusal to recognize him as the founding patriarch, the Buddhist layman and scholar, Pulhua uh, Ijeyar, who had strongly advocated for the recognition of Chinur as the founding patriarch of Korean Buddhism in a series of articles published in 1942, began to pen new articles in the late 1960s to claim once again that Chinur was the rightful founding patriarch of the Joge order. Pabun Ijongik and Songchar's longtime friend Chung Dam submitted a restoration plan for the Choge Order of Korean Buddhism to the Central Administration meeting for review in 1969. The plan proposed to recognize Jinul as the founding patriarch. The plan was ignored, and in protest, Chung Dam, a former Supreme Patriarch, left the Choge Order. Lee jong -ik continued to publish articles in the 70s in support of the claim that Chinur was the rightful pa founding patriarch of the Chogyo order. Song Choi wrote the Dharma lineage of Korean Buddhism as a direct response to these claims. The Dharma lineage of Korean Buddhism carefully examines various sources that contain information, any information about monks and lineages in Korea. Song Chor used these sources as evidence of an unbroken chain of masters who silently and directly transmitted the Dharma from one generation to the next. The Dharma lineage of Korean Buddhism was, in other words, Song Chor's attempt to provide historical and scientific evidence of a Dharma lineage that can be traced back to Tego Po and ultimately Linji Ishen and the sixth patriarch. But Song Chor clearly did not see this as good enough. A few years later, he published The Orthodox Path of the Sun School to tackle the issue from a different angle. Instead of looking for historical or scientific evidence, this time Song Chor chose to rely on a, a higher authority. He tried to demonstrate that only Tego, Linji, and the Sixth Patriarch could be considered rightful patriarchs of the Sun School since they, unlike Chinur, taught uh, um, and only taught people to see their own nature and directly experience no mind. Lest there be any doubt about the authenticity of this teaching, Song Chor also extensively reviewed evidence of the authenticity of this teaching. In essence, he tried to show that no experience other than an authentic experience of no mind could be maintained while awake, sleep, uh, dreaming, or even in deep sleep. This, he was convinced, was not only self-evident, but also clearly evinced in the most authoritative Buddhist sources. In no less than 19 chapters, Song Chor meticulously and systematically goes through all the relevant passages he could find to demonstrate that there is a fundamental difference between what he calls experiential awakening, or chung o, and discursive awakening, or heo, which he believed to be the inferior awakening advocated by Jinul. But as Song Chor himself explains, the very distinction between discursive and experiential awakening is just a heuristic tool and expedient means. There is, in other words, only one real awakening, and that is seeing one's own nature, which is what he is calling experiential awakening. He nevertheless repeatedly draws a sharp contrast between the two to show that discursive awakening, the awakening advocated by uh, the teaching school, namely Hua Yan, Tian Tai, Fa Xiang, and so on, is nothing more than the knowing of the content of real awakening, and hence an intellectual partial awakening that requires further gradual cultivation. No real Chan or Sun master, according to Song Chor, ever taught to pursue such an awakening. The publication of the Orthodox Path of the Sun School in 1981 by the new Supreme Patriarch naturally stirred much controversy. Although some within the Choge order were receptive to its claims, other remained skeptical. 
Song Char's claims later received closer scrutiny and eventually criticism, especially from the monks at Chinur's monastery, Songguangsa, where a new institute, Bojo Sasang Yongguan, devoted to the study of Chinur was established in 1987. A large body of modern scholarship on Sun orthodoxy and history emerged in the process. This has fortunately generated much interest in Korean Buddhism. It has also produced sharp divisions within the Korean monastic and scholastic communities. Due in large part to the acrimonious founding patriarch debate that continued to loom large over the Jogi order all throughout the 60s and 70s, Song Char's book has all too often been pigeonholed as a political text and its arguments have consequently been reduced to partisan politics. Song Char's work and especially his claim about, the, about experiential awakening, however, can be contextualized in other ways as well. It should be noted here that the 60s and 70s were a particularly disturbing time for the Joget order. Non-celibate monks refusing the compromise sought in the unified order established in 1962 launched lawsuits to uh, reclaim what once belonged to them. The compromise sought in 1962 also irked the more radical wing of the reform movement, which led uh, monks like Cheongdam and others to submit uh, the restoration plan in 1969. The plan was not, however, just a response to what was considered to be a failed attempt at reform. The plan was a response to the violence and corruption within the Korean Buddhist Sangha that could no longer be kept a secret. In the late 1960s, land that belonged to the monastery Bungunza was sold at, at first illegally by its non-celibate abbots and their families for private profit, and later by the Jogi order to fund development of Dongguk University. The land located in today's Cheongdam-dong in Seoul happened to occupy an area slated for development by the, uh, by, uh, the Park Jung-hee government. In 1968, the abbot of Bulguksa was imprisoned against his will by other monks, inspectors dispatched by the central administration. Controversies like this continued to occur in the 70s. In 1973, the abbot of Sangeza imprisoned and tortured the abbot of one of its branch temples, Boriam. In 1975, monk administrators and the abbot of Sujongsa were arrested for fraud. But arguably, the most shocking incident occurred that same year. Kim Dae Shim and others attacked and occupied Jogeza and the central administration headquarters. The attackers imprisoned Supreme Patriarch Song and Chief uh, Executive uh, Young Am and forced them to surrender control of the Jogye order. The attackers were eventually arrested on charges of grand larceny and attempted murder. Song Char's work on Sun Orthodoxy was being prepared during these chaotic times. The central administration was embroiled in one controversy after another, often due to the disagreements about money and power, which remained under the control of the Supreme Patriarch and his chief executive. There was a strong sense of crisis within the Chogyo order. There was also a strong sense that established institutions were part of the problem and not the solution. Cheongdam's restoration plan and the subsequent departure from the Chogyo order should be understood as a response to, the, to this institutional crisis. Song Char's work should be understood against the backdrop of this crisis as well. Song Char believed the Jogi order lacked authenticity and failed to demonstrate proper religious authority. He refused to find a solution in established institutions or even in institutional reform. Authenticity, he believed, could only be found in the individual and her personal experience of awakening. It could not be found in secular or religious institutions. This was a message that resonated with his lay followers. Young college students disillusioned by Park jung hees dictatorial Yushin government and reform-minded monks looking for alternatives to the failed solutions attempted in the past. And this, of course, was the vision that Song Chur took with him all the way to the top when he became Supreme Patriarch of the Jogye Order. Thank you very much. <laughs>